So the purpose of our group is we are trying to uh, highlight uh, incredible stories about uh, Canadian soldiers and their heroism and bring them to the Canadian public. Uh, we're hoping to uh, begin uh, with a documentary about Afghanistan veterans and hoping that one of them will eventually be upgraded to the Victoria Cross. Now, Shots with Soldiers started uh, with General Rick Hillier, and unfortunately he's unable to be here because he's uh, uh, vaccinating Ontario. And uh, so he's uh, incapacitated, but we've had people fill in. Well, this week I'm gonna be doing the host, uh, hosting duties and I have a very special soldier I'm gonna present to you. And we wanna thank you know everyone for being a part of this. Our Facebook pages and our Instagram page and all our other pages have uh, reached almost 12,000 followers. So we want to thank you and uh, thank you for all your support and your, you know, we just started on November 10th. So everyone, please, uh, you know, thank you so much for this uh, great uh, uh, outgoing um, support. So anyways, I wanted to do today's presentation about this man. Carmenu Briffa. So Carmenu was born September 30th, 1911. And he was born on the island of Malta. And he was the fifth of seven children. And when he was seven, his father immigrated to the United States. And uh, when he was eight, the last remaining older sibling, so four of his older siblings passed away. Um, about this time, the contact with the father in the United States uh, stopped, uh, the money stopped coming back. And his mother, Luguarda, was heartbroken, obviously over the loss of her fourth child and the abandonment from her husband. And she dies when Carmenu is nine, now orphaned, essentially. The remaining family members take in the younger siblings, but nobody wants to take him in. Partly because his four, his, his four older siblings passed away about the a same age uh, time that he is at the time. So they think perhaps he doesn't have much longer to live uh, as, as well. And the other part was because he's a little bit older and I guess not as cute as his younger siblings. Um, he bounced around from family to family. Uh, one story goes that an uncle made himself peanuts on the side of the road. And he didn't sell enough one night and uh, he beat him with the bucket that the peanuts came in and he had a scar on his forehead from it. Um, it was at this point that he was put in the reform school and he uh, uh, was on, uh, lived there. And it is around this time that the, the, the story gets a little murky. Uh, but what we do know is that on November 4th, 1929, he joined the uh, Royal Maltese Artillery. Now, he served in the regular army until he transferred to the reserves uh, uh, in 1937. So about he spent three years in the reserve army. And about this time, he met his wife, Mary. And on June 10th, 1939, uh, the two of them uh, married in Malta. And he told her that he was in the reserves, that the war wouldn't be coming to Malta. She had nothing to worry about. And that, you know, he would just sit, uh, the, the, the World War II, World War I didn't reach, you know, the whole world. It was mostly, you know, uh, it met, he, 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 he assured her that she, everything would be fine. So on, oddly enough, on their first wedding anniversary, the Italians started bombing Malta. And in fact, uh, right shortly after it looked like France was going to capitulate, Italy, deciding, seeing an opportunity here, decided that it was going to start bombing Malta. Um, his Mary uh, talked about some of the first air raids and talked about how there was a priest uh, walking around trying to calm people down. And um, one of the bombs struck and decapitated the priest. Uh, and he still kept walking around as if he was trying to calm everyone down until eventually his body crumpled to the ground. So it was very, uh, and that would be the first of two consecutive years that Malta would be bomb bombarded by the uh, Axis powers. In fact, only two days 
did they not get bombed? And that was due to inclement weather. Most bombed country in all of Europe uh, during the war. So um, the island would be, uh, so obviously Malta was very strategic and important to the Mediterranean. It was called the linchpin of the, of the Mediterranean Sea. And at the time of the bombings, that is actually, uh, sorry, I'm jumping around here. But at the time of the bombings, Mary was actually um, five months pregnant uh, with her son, Victor. Now, what's interesting here is Victor was uh, born, got sick, died, and was buried all during air raids. And in fact, he, um, uh, my, my grandparents, my grandparents, I gave away the, see the, the story here. My grandparents never knew where Victor was buried. Um, so obviously after Victor passed, my uh, Carmel Carmenu was very distraught over the loss of his son. And Mary would describe the fateful night uh, that she heard his rifle dragging on the road and he had gotten drunk and went AWOL. Now he got charged and was uh, subsequently reduced in rank from a sergeant to a private uh, for being drunk on duty. So obviously the, the, the bombings was taking a toll on the Maltese people. And in fact, at this time in 19, about 19, early 1942, Malta was considered in capitulation um, only for the British to try to alleviate the island. And in fact, at one time they had sent a, uh, a convoy to try to alleviate send supplies to the island and of the 17 ships supply ships that were sent only three managed to make it to the island and of those three two of them were bombed in the harbor and their supplies were lost so only one ship were able to make it was able to get unloaded and su uh, supply the uh, Maltese uh, um, people I think what is interesting here was after the airborne invasion of Crete and the, the high casualties that the, uh, the Nazis took, they balked at the uh, thought of doing a uh, aerial uh, invasion of Malta, partly because of the fact that the, uh, the people in Malta were seen as very, uh, were called hedgehogs, essentially. And what ended up happening was anytime a uh, fighter pilot was downed, an Axis fighter pilot was downed in Malta, from the guns, uh, they would then, uh, have, the British would have to try to race to, to, to save the, the pilot because the locals would rip him, literally rip him apart. Um, the other thing too was obviously early on in the war, the British were uh, very unprepared. And uh, famously, they only had three planes, three biplanes that were meant for a, a, a ship uh, called uh, Hope, uh, Vic, uh, Hope. Uh, the three planes were one was called Hope, and then the other two. Uh, I'm blanking here, but uh, so, anyways, uh, <clears throat> Carmel worked the air defense guns, and on two occasions switched leave with fellow soldiers. Once for his anniversary, and another for a friend's wife's birthday. And both times, his battery took a direct hit. And after that, he refused to switch leaves after that. He decided that if it was going to be his time, he was going to uh, do it you know, properly. He could no longer live with the fact that both times that he switched leaves, that he ended up, uh, that his battery ended up taking direct hits and everyone dying. Um, so obviously, Carmel and Mary endured intense conditions, uh, uh, just like everyone else on the island. But eventually, the conditions improved and the Americans entered the war. Uh, Africa was won, and the island became the staging point for the invasion of Sicily. At this point, King George award announced that the whole island would be awarded the George Cross for all the sacrifices they made. And once the bombings uh, stopped, uh, the island still had a gargantuan task of rebuilding. See you here as uh, uh, King George is uh, visiting the island, and this is Carmel right here being inspected by the king. So, um, so thankfully, Carmel and Mary would welcome uh, new additions uh, to the family. 
Uh, Anne would be born in 1943, Vivian in 1945, and Richard in 1947. Uh, they decided that they wanted to give their life, their, their children a better life, and in 1950 moved to uh, uh, Canada. Now, Mary had a specific request that they not move to, to the United States. So at this point, Carmel had regained uh, contact with his father, who was working in Detroit for Henry Ford, uh, and probably started working there doing the uh, early Model Ts and stuff like that. So um, uh, they compromised and decided that Windsor, Ontario would be where they would go to, close to Detroit, so it was close to some known family. And so Carmel, who learned uh, uh, English in the British Army, uh, came over and established themselves and got themselves set up. Now, Mary is now coming over on a ship. She is eight months pregnant, and she has a, a, a daughter that is three, daughter that is five, and a son that is three, or a daughter that is seven, daughter that is five, and a son that is three. And while she's eight months pregnant, <laughs> comes over to Canada, and as um, soon as they arrive, the ship is immediately condemned. Uh, and no longer is no longer considered seaworthy. And in fact, during the trip, uh, a large window fell out into the ocean while two the two girls were leaning on it. And people said that had they been a couple inches over, they would have fallen into the sea. So it was a very stressful time, especially I couldn't imagine being eight months pregnant on a, a, a three week uh, trip with three young children. And so they arrived in Windsor, Ontario, and. Uh, they started a family. And here's uh, the last picture. There's only one of the, the uh, uh, family members is not uh, in this picture, but this is the uh, five of the six and them. And one of the last pictures that uh, Carmel would ever uh, take. In fact, he never talked about the war. He hardly ever did. And uh, a lot of the information we were able to get through was through Mary or my grandmother. And uh, he, uh, yeah, refused to talk about it very much, but he did. In fact, he he was so adamant that he didn't want to talk about it that he donated his medals that he got to the mission to be melted down for I guess to pay. You know, that's how. So after Mary passed away in nineteen or two thousand eleven, the family got together, and this is this is the uh, this is the end results of uh, Carmel and Mary coming to Canada and surviving. The war in Malta is, you know, the family that they created. So, you know, through all these people that have, you know, that served and fought, the millions of people that fought in the wars and came home, and then life started up again. Life started, and they, you know, continued on. And uh, in a lot of a lot of ways, uh, Europe was devastated, and they came to North America and started a, a family and a life, a new life. And this, you know, was the result of that. And uh, we're very fortunate that we were able to uh, do this. I'm going to do the stop share. Sorry. And we're going to go to, so if everyone wants to get their, their, uh, their drinks ready, I wanted to say that this was, this episode, it was, I was inspired in large part because of David O'Keefe's episode. Um, uh, that he did about his grandfather. And uh, I, I feel like I didn't hold a candle to that, but I would like to toast to Carmel and Mary Briffa and the family. As you can see, we have many of Carmel and Mary's children and uh, uh, grandchildren here. So to Carmel and Mary Briffa, salute. Mom and dad. Um, salute. All right. So we'll take some questions. How do you say salute Andrew? to Maltese? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Anthony, can you answer that? What was it? How do you say uh, salute in Maltese? Uh, Saha. Saha. Oh. <laughs> Saha. Saha. By the way, um, I would like to point out the, the names of the three planes you mentioned. Yes, I forgot. They, uh, they were uh, of the type Gloucester gladiators. 
and they were nicknamed Faith, Hope, and Charity. Faith, Hope, and Charity. That's right. I I, I had it written down, and I couldn't find where I'd written it down. Uh, From right. the Bible. Right? Uh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oddly enough, when those planes were uh, found, they, they took them apart and built them. And then the British said, oh, you're not authorized to use these. You need to put them back in their crates. And then finally, somebody said, are you kidding me? We need these planes right now. And they're, you know, yes, we need to put them together. And finally, they allowed them to put them together and use them. So, yeah, those two, those three planes were, you know, biplanes fighting the, the, yeah. the Italians that were obviously their, their planes were much more advanced. So, yeah, they, it was a rough go for the Maltese there early on. How did the Bruce, how did the elder siblings all die? So the, the theory is that uh, the, 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 there's thalassemia in the family bloodline. So both of my great grandparents would have had the minor and the four children uh, that the four oldest siblings would have had the major and would have died from uh, thalassemia major. And usually in those days, if you had thalassemia, you didn't live past adolescence. So it, it kind of correlates to the, the, uh, the theory of that they had that, but we don't, it, I, I can't confirm that. <clears throat> so yeah, no, they, uh, my, my grandparent, my grandfather's early life is, is, is fascinating on just how, um, how he, 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 you know, and how much he endured early on and how, how he, he got Jesus. to where he did. Um, but yeah. Any other questions? What did uh, what did Mary do to, during the war? Did she have any sort of support role or anything like that? So, from what I understand, she helped with the the butchers. The, her because her dad was a butcher, right? So our great grandfather. So from what I understand, she helped him uh, her, there. Her and, grandfather was a butcher too, and she sewed. She was a seamstress like her mother. So she sewed. She used to knit my dad socks for the army. <laughs> and Viv, do you wanna? Uh, I pick up a lot of information. I never even knew. To be honest, um, like coming coming to Canada, all I thought was mom and Anne and Richard. All like I remember that wall. That part I thought it was a wall, but I guess it was a window. I remember mom telling us that. And then Richard taking a real bad fall down some stairs, and she had to deal with that. And the fact that uh, we never liked the food other than the cookies they had. And Ann and I would go, and nobody was looking. I'd hold my guts up, she'd throw the cookies in, and we'd take off. That's the, I don't remember that. I don't realize it took us that long on that ship. I know we were about to get off. And I remember, according to mom, we ended up in New York, and we had a cousin. And he took us out for supper, and of course, we were used to the food. So he gave my dad, mom a jar of hard candy, and he told her, don't let them have anything because they didn't eat. And once we got on the train heading to Detroit, my mom started giving us the candy. Wow. No, I just, I couldn't imagine that trip. And you guys were on the, at the sea for three, yeah. three weeks, and you didn't really have a, uh, uh, like, I mean, it's just, it's crazy, especially being eight months pregnant and, you know. Gosh, I didn't realize how good she was, you know, to take on something like that. Yeah. Said, well, here come kids. It had to be an anything. It had so, to be scary for her too. Mm -hmm. Anybody? So it, my grandparents never ended up knowing where Victor was buried. And Aunt Viv ended up, and mom ended up finding uh, where he was buried. And Aunt Viv was able to go and visit and so next july um i'm hoping to get to malta and uh, aunt viv's hoping to get there and we're going to hopefully figure out a way to put a uh, a plaque on victor's grave that indicates that he's actually there so we also, yeah. we also found where mom um, was in a shelter and calling victor he was, he was sick at that time and that's that, that, what, the way I got it, that uh, grandpa wanted, if there was an area going on, if there's an area going on, they're not allowed to meet the base. And he was ready to go with the beaver through, and he told he couldn't. So I don't know who it was that he hit. Maybe he was higher up. At that time, I think he had lost. Uh, 
Yeah, eight. Well, she's well, she's eight. Yeah, no. she was seventeen and a half when she got married. So she was only eighteen uh, and a half when the the, the bombing started. Uh, but uh, yeah, Grandpa Grandpa lost his Nanu lost his stripes three times, or two three times. Two so. times. Yeah. We went looking for that uh, yeah. <laughs> at Harry. Yeah. So and when we yeah. went to the cemetery, uh, you showed it to us children. since 1972. So, anyways, this has been another episode of Shots with Soldiers. We'll be back in two weeks. We have a great, great guest for you in two weeks. And then in another two weeks after that, Dr. David O'Keefe is going to do another uh, episode. So, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for letting me present, you know, my, uh, my grandfather and my grandmother and our, their time on, during the Maltese War. And this has been another episode of Shots with Soldiers. Please like and share. And uh, yeah, 